so the thing about going last is by the time you get up to say anything, everybody said everything you wanted to say, and you feel like you're sort of the chair of the Department of Redundancy and Repetition, and, and Redundancy. Um, <laughs> Um, but, but I think, I mean, there, there, there's something really beautiful and human about this notion that we can work across the science society divide by going back to some sort of elemental acknowledgement of the, of the fact that we all bring different perspectives and different tools to the table. Some of us bring them from our science background, some of them bring us from our cultural background, and in fact all of us bring both sets of tools to the table. And, and I think acknowledging that kind of respect and building a relationship in that respect, while it takes time up front, I really believe that that time invested up front is earned back at, the, at sort of another step in the process where you can move results into practice in a much more efficient and and, and focused way. Um, and I, I love this idea, right, that it's, it's, at some level it's sort of simple, right? It's as simple, I think I heard today, as show up, shut up, and eat up, right? Simply travel, be there, spend time, and, and be willing to eat until you have to go to the bathroom, I guess, according to Bob. So, so the Thriving Earth Exchange is, is AGU's effort to invest in this notion of community science and to suggest that community science is an appropriate activity for a society to engage in and a society like AGU can help support its members in adding this toolkit to their repertoire of tools that they can use in their own scientific careers and that it's part of our responsibility as a scientific society to not just to help people advance the frontiers of knowledge but also to help make that knowledge useful and applicable and relevant. That's what we're trying to do with the Thriving Earth Exchange. I think about it as having four key parts. The first is this idea of community science, this approach to doing science that's participatory and engaging all the way from beginning to end. The second is a set of projects that really exemplify this approach, that are pilot efforts. The third is a set of tools that we develop in order not only to serve those pilot projects, but to launch hundreds of those projects, to scale those projects and their impact across many local communities. And finally, and probably most importantly, is a set of people, a set of people who are willing to engage in these practices and to think about these practices and to advance these practices. And that's the reason for having sessions like this, is to invite people into the Thriving Earth Exchange. So I want to talk a little bit more about some of the projects, and I've tried something I've never done before. This is like a word-free PowerPoint. Okay, so, <laughs> well, you should wait till the end before you applaud, it could suck. Um, <laughs> I, I, sorry, we're, on, we're being recorded, it could be suboptimal. Um, <laughs> so one of our projects is based in South Central Kentucky. It's a group of water managers who the data that they're currently using to make water projections, to make water decisions about when and where um, to declare drought and when to restrict watering is entirely state-level data. And they're finding that state-level data doesn't provide the kind of resolution they want to make decisions about their county. They put out a challenge and a group from Western Kentucky University identified the availability of local high-resolution data sets that they could use to build together a set of tools that those water managers could use to make locally-based decisions. Another project is in the Pamir Mountains, which are on the Afghanistan-Tajikistan border. It's a region where traditional calendars have guided agricultural and pastoral calendars, uh, practices. And these calendars are incredibly well suited to local conditions. This is an incredibly heterogeneous area. You can marry from a village, one village to a village 30 kilometers away and find the calendar has changed, right? Because the calendars are so appropriately suited to the environment, because they've been They've been developed through generations of living and responding to those conditions. For the last hundred years, though, it's been very difficult to use those calendars and to adapt those calendars because of the geopolitical context. Um, those villagers have asked for the help of climate scientists, the partnership of climate scientists, to think about how climate information can help them bring their calendars back up to current conditions and help them move their calendars forward in time. Another project is a group of five neighborhoods in Denver. These five neighborhoods have been working with public health researchers since 1996 to understand some of the factors that influence public health in their communities. They've been able to change zoning laws to bring in new um, grocery stores and to allow local production of, of fruits and vegetables because they recognize the public impact that that would have, the public health impact. 
they've started to see environmental connections to public health, and they'd like to reach out to scientists to develop a locally based network of sensors that can complement the EPA network and identify local point sources of pollution and help them work to mitigate those sources of pollution. And then the final example is a geologist um, who, an exploration geologist who's worked in Nepal and is now working on um, Pine Ridge Reservation with Lakota Indians to map out the distribution of heavy metals in the aquifers and to build low-cost filters made out of stuff you can buy at Home Depot that would remove those heavy metals from the water and from the drinking water, even as they're trying to understand where those heavy metals are most prevalent. Those are examples of the kinds of projects that Tex is supporting as pilot projects. And what we're hoping to learn from those projects is what are the tools and supports that projects and scientists and communities need to be able to build projects like this in hundreds of locations. And we think we've identified a set of tools, tools that will take you all the way from this initial conversation all the way to locally um, relevant, locally impactful science. And those, those tools start with a discussion and um, solution session, a public forum where people can pose the scientific challenges or the cultural challenges or the community challenges, and you can start to have a dialogue to go from big, broad questions to very specific, actionable kinds of questions. And you can start to solicit solutions from all over the world and engage in a conversation about which look most promising and which look most likely to be successful. We're doing that in partnership with a group at MIT. They've hosted conversations on climate change. Um, they have about 14,000 members. And what we think we can bring to the table is the scientific expertise of AGU members. It's an opportunity for AGU members to participate in that forum. Um, it's also an opportunity for communities to pose their challenges in these kinds of forums and begin this kind of discussion. Recognizing that resources are important, we're trying to look for new partnerships that can bring resources to the table. We talked before this session about the fragmentation of resources. And we're trying to pull some of those resources together and coalesce them so that they can align toward these efforts. At the same time, we're trying to make, take that same ethic of sort of grassroots participation and bring that to the funding. So we've partnered with a group called experiment.com to try to see if we can bring crowdfunding tools into the scientific arena. And the last piece is this notion of volunteerism. And I think this is important because the paradigm for much of this co-production research has been that the researchers are doing this as part of a scientific career, as part of a paid job, and community members are being asked to do this for their own good because of the good of their community as volunteers. And we want to bring some parity back to that. And one of the ways to do this is to at least explore positioning this as a volunteer activity all the way around. So this is um, earlier today, uh, um, the founder of Zipcar talked about um, spare capacity as an opportunity. This is that notion of spare capacity in a scientific community, in a local community, and trying to marry that, sp marry that spare capacity around these co the, this participatory kinds of science and work together in that way. The last thing I said when I got up here was that the most important part of the Thriving Earth Exchange is a group of people who are willing to try this out. And I think it's a group of people who are willing to embrace a slightly different mindset. I grew up as a geoscientist, and as a geoscientist, I was sort of, I think, set up to believe that people are the problem. The planet would be a much better place if we could just package all the people and get them out of here, right? Um, or to put it another way, one of the key problems we face is that there's going to be nine billion people on the planet. That's what this art represents. This is a picture by an artist from Seattle named Chris Jordan, who's incredibly concerned about the impact humans are having on the planet. And, re and, and his goal is to make that concern visceral not intellectual, not statistical, but, but to feel, to, to hit you sort of in the chest with that concern. And, and what this is, is this is almost actual size. And it looks like forests, but as you walk closer and closer to it, you realize that it's stacks and stacks of paper bags. It's 1.4 million paper bags, which is the number of paper bags thrown away in the US in, anybody want to guess? How, what? A little lower. It was a month, a little lower than a month. A week, a little lower. This is, this is a, a little lower. An hour, right? 
That's a pessimistic view of humanity. It's, it's, it's got its basis in fact, but it's a pessimistic view of humanity. Another view, same artist, Chris Jordan. This is a work that he did called E Pluribus Unum. It's a mandala, but as you walk closer and closer, it resolves. Each of those, each of those lines resolves into a line of text, which then become the name of a million different organizations that are devoted to environmental justice, environmental equity, indigenous cultural preservation, and peace. And if you think about that, that view of the world says that we don't have nine billion people on the planet who are problems. We have nine billion potential partners in science, potential people we can work with to do this kind of participatory research. And if that's a view that interests you, if that's a view that you're excited about, we're asking you to consider joining us in the Thriving Earth Exchange. We don't know exactly, oh man, I'm just going to say it. We don't know exactly what the hell we're doing, but we're trying to figure it out. And we'd love to have your help doing that. Thank you. I hear we can edit the tape later, so we can, uh, we can make adjustments for it. So, so I'm going to invite the panelists to come on up here. And for the audience, if, if you've uh, sneaked in a little late or whatever, feel free to move on up closer so we can all participate in the conversation. Oh, I, look, we have an exciting question already. Even oh, better. I no, I so don't. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so I was really interested to see that NASA has some sort of open source citizen science kind of thing available. Uh, I work with a similar hydrology model through the Forest Service, so we're always looking to uh, engage communities and make tools that are useful and palatable to them. So I was wondering, I guess you have an example of something that's in process and happening right now, but what are your recommendations for uh, making this useful for a wide range of audiences and incorporating communities without necessarily engaging with them directly? That, that's what we're trying to do with Amazon. Really, it's kind of a hands-off collaboration. You know, We put the data out there, we put the tools, we put the lectures out there, everything is out there. And it's not on our computers, you know, we don't have a problem with the security, legal, and all that stuff. So, and they're also paying themselves, actually, when they use the data on Amazon, you know, they're paying for the access. It's small, I mean, maybe a few dollars, but everything is being done on their own, you know. So we are providing the best data and then the best knowledge, really. And, and, and we found, you know, even though we tried to do it inside NASA, you know, after four years we kind of gave up, you know, there are certain things, especially engaging larger communities, it's not possible at, at places like, you know, the federal government, really. Yeah. And uh, that's part of the reason that we went into this public-private partnership. And they, you know, they, they've been great partners. They host the data for free for us, so the Amazon, that's their contribution. So they, they, they put the bill, in the bill for the entire data set. So, uh, so everybody you know, wins, actually. The Amazon is making money on what people are using in terms of their computing, and we have data available, and then the, you know, everybody has you know, free access to the data on the system. So. Sure. Yeah. You know, the, that's where the community gets involved. Eh? They they help each other. You know, they you know, let's say you go do something with the data, and then you want to share, and then all you have to do is put it in the marketplace on Amazon, and it's available to everybody. Eh? Yeah. So, and uh, you can you know, there is a forum. You can ask, and ask a question, and one of the the members would answer them. Yeah. So, you know, and they're all searchable. So, you know, maybe somebody already answered your question, so you can go search. So it's actually quite an uh, efficient way of uh, doing community science, you know. And what we're using the NEX, the, 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 the original NEX, is mainly for producing large data sets, like this downscaling. That we cannot do on Amazon because it becomes expensive to, 
to to host the data and all that stuff. So that we can accomplish where you know we have the resources. But when we produce the data, we can put it out you know, for the public. Yeah. Does anyone else want to respond to any part of that? Or no, thank you for the lovely question. All right, I, I'd, I would like to address the audience, though, before I, I address the panelists. So how many of you have been involved in some kind of research effort um, situated in some community? Oh, no, okay, so we have choir people here. That's, that's always good. How many of you are thinking about the possibility of doing such a thing? Oh, great. Okay, so you folks, look at me, I don't know. Okay, so good. I, I understand the half, uh, half raising of the, of the hand. So those of you who are thinking about it, I, I'd like to know from you all what hesitancy, what kinds of questions or issues do you have that we might be able to talk about in more detail that would enable you to make that decision? Thank you. Hi, I'm um, uh, Gretchen Goldman with the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, one thing I take from this and is just the, uh, I guess the the level of commitment that is involved, and um, you know this seems it's a it's really important to do that, and that's how you you do it justice and, and what it deserves to get that attention. Um, but it, you know, for me in thinking about uh, my next project, which of course, you know, our projects in general have timelines that I need to do, and there's, um, and, and in the mo for the most part, uh, I'm not gonna be able to devote an entire project around a particular issue. Um, but if I'm doing something that very much relates to a community and I'd like to get there, that perspective, be able to give that voice um, some airtime in what we're doing, um, but this, Th this and, and just thinking about these issues in general makes me hesitant to do that because I don't want it to feel like it's it's just a side issue. I just wanted to like check the box that I made it, you know, include that. And so, is there a way? I, I'd be curious if, if from you all, if you know of a way you can sort of be able to lift that voice, but without making it seem like it's an afterthought from the part of if it's part of a much bigger thing or, or something that where that isn't the focus of, of what we're doing, but I'd like to be able to at least acknowledge its relevance. Mm -hmm. Pass that on yeah. down. I mean, I think that the way we've done that, when, because we also function under often very tight budgets, very tight timelines, quite clear deliverables, is um, by being very careful about how we, you know, how much we bite off, you know, in terms of a project, to have something that's fairly clearly defined, not that we're framing the box first, but where we're engaging. So in a location where, for example, we know there have been a set of issues, having it quite tightly defined around that, that area so that um, one can actually have a fairly focused set of dialogues with communities, um, but also not have it completely blow out in terms of your process, your time, and, and what you have available, because that's reasonable. The other thing that has been absolutely central in our work is to have sequences of projects in an area so that we establish relationships with areas rather than doing things one off. And that's been really fundamental and is actually more an important part of this. So in our work across South and Southeast Asia, we may have had over 20 years hundreds of projects, but they are often with core sets of partners that we build on with them so that actually the engagement, some of the trust is there. One of the things we're encouraging our tribal college faculty and students to consider is in terms of the questions that were treated in the national assessment is to go to that chapter. That chapter is with 200 some odd footnotes and almost every sentence was footnoted. Um, and that you could probably find sites you could probably find leads to people. You could probably find um, research areas that um, have been identified now. Um, you understand that the way science works 
is that these things were identified three, four years ago, five years ago, and finally by the deadline March of um, two and a half years ago, three years ago, um, that was the cutoff, and then we had to write from that. But there is that wealth of information that was deemed by a number of folks in Indian country to be relevant to these kinds of questions. Go there and start that, use that as a, as a lead. Um, there's organizations such as um, Honor the Earth, for example, that have been busy funding for at least a dozen years um, native groups doing different things in resilience, um, local foods, all of these kinds of things. There are people there who know people in those communities. So networking, even in indigenous America, would be a, is an opportunity for you to, um, to sh not, not short circuit or shortcut it, but certainly find those areas that are relevant and people who are doing relevant work. So from the standpoint of the, the issue, as Bob is saying, there's a network of folks who actually have been engaged for a long time, helping to support that set of interdisciplinary research that has an application focus is critical. You see it in the climate science centers that uh, Interior has started, and a long-standing set of programs called the Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments that NOAA supports at universities around the country. There are 11 of them whose sole goal is to create, be there for a long time, to create the knowledge network and to get deep knowledge about a system. Engaging with them lets you engage with the network that's there. The second part is to ensure that the last bit that I put up and, and others mentioned here is critical. That the capacity of the people for whom, with whom you want to work has to be ensured as well. So supporting the local development of people's capabilities and capacities so that it's not simply uh, what do you want and how can I provide it, but you're actually working on constructing the question together is critical. So we play a big role in helping to support people from those communities in getting the training. You play a role in training as well as research. The latter bit is really important to me, which is people like, like Marcus, Bob, there's a guy in the audience there, Ted Mellis from the USGS. Whenever you read what has made adaptive management successful, they tell you it's monitoring over the long term, people's willingness to look at things in a new way, and the individuals who've dedicated their lives to making it work. That latter bit is not trivial. It's not a one-off. And so the capacity of people with whom you want to work, the networks and engaging with them, but also deciding that this is something you want to be engaged in as a way of getting the public's value for their investment in science. Hi, I have uh, two questions that are pretty different actually. Uh, one is if any of you have any experience with creating kind of broader networks where you are engaging communities um, but very different communities across a similar topic but you know, you know on different sides of the country that don't necessarily interact and how you um, you know, how do you how do you fully engage with each of these individual communities to have a broader um, uh, network around the same topic, and then also how do you engage a community um, or what are strategies for communities where um, it's not a cohesive unit of support for whatever project it is, but you say you are interested in engaging a community around. Um, pollution from hydraulic fracturing or something. And of course, that's also the primary employer in that community. So you have some that are really concerned about the environmental health impacts and some that are really concerned about their own and, you know, economic impacts. And so how do you deal with, um, with those kind of political touchy issues? And pass it on. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I just assume one of you all is Anybody want to give it a shot? I'll, I'll give a starting shot on what, what we've done. We've been working with the Asian Cities Climate Change Network, which is across Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, India, Pakistan, other areas. So these are areas with different language groups. Um, travel is very different. Completely different governance structures. Vietnam is very hierarchical. India is nonlinear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Sorry. Give, the yeah. Do you want to be right, right. Um, and there, there it's relied on layers. Basically, having very strong local partners who are deeply engaged so that they have a sustained presence and they're often have relationships, have multiple funding streams, multiple activities areas. So when you have a strong relationship with them, you can work with them very closely at that local level. But then they're often um, able to kind of interact across scale too because your local city officials in Vietnam won't have the language skills to work regionally, for example, and it's very, very difficult to get engagement at that level. But you have people who have been working very closely with them, who are Vietnamese, who do have the language skills and who do have the concepts and so on. And so it's kind of a layered networking strategy. It's imperfect. You don't have the same level of engagement at different levels and that sort of thing. But it has in involved or enabled um, kind of a sustained focus across a broad region. Um, and it's often with people who have very different incentive structures. The Vietnamese government, they make their money by selling the agricultural land around the city. They want to develop everything in the low-lying areas. A lot of people in other areas have completely different incentive structures. And so, you know, in some cases that means that there's a listening to that and having to say, well, you know, you, you need a different strategy in different areas. It's similar issues, but it's not trying to uniform and, you know, cookie cutter the strategies. So that helps as well. Um, it does become this, this question of time and engagement and so on, but you tend to find points of traction where, where people have issues that are very central to them and that also relate to the bigger picture, and that's, you know, finding those is, is, is a key part in building a network. I think, I think one of the advantages of building that network is, is it, takes, it takes you out. If you can build it without needing to be the hub, you've really created a powerful network. So there are a lot of integrated approaches to doing things, right? Integrated watershed management, integrated coastal zone. All don't work well in practice, but the idea of integration is being able to publicly discuss the assumptions that you're making over time, how robust your assumptions are over time. In the context of things like that, we've had really strong watershed coalitions started up uh, for a long time now in Montana with very diverse interests right, on the Colorado and elsewhere. To give you a sense of how history plays a role, the most contentious watershed, one of the most in the, in the country, is actually the Apalachicola Cola Chattahoochee Flint in the southeast, not the dry states of the west as we usually think. So what does that mean? It means that a communications framing is inadequate to address this problem when you're dealing with fundamental differences in values about the outcomes. What do you try to do? You work where people have established good collaborative networks and you ask the question, what are the assumptions about planning into the long term? And how do you work with that network? That lets you enter into the point in which you're not trying to solve the conflicting issue by the first time you're, in, you're working with that group. That comes over time and people are more upfront about their differences. So you don't want to start by saying, well, we have a lot of differences. This is, I don't know how we'll ever get around this. Because information by itself doesn't solve that problem. Because they're about fundamental differences and values. So you, work, you get into the area in which people are dealing with integrated problems already. And you show the value of the scientific information in helping to improve the outcomes. From that standpoint, you have, what we're getting at is really not a non-conflicting situation. So anybody that thinks that you know, choices about our future was, will, will not have conflicts, will not have winners and losers, um, that's really what we're trying to understand. Right? It sounds good, yeah, we all get together, secure the common good, but that's not always the outcome. So. Julie, did you want to add anything? I, you had that look on your face. I wasn't... Uh... I, I wasn't stake, sure about that. It's okay. stake winners and stake losers, not stakeholders. Yeah. Right, right. Um, wonderful questions. Did we get to everything you were asking us about before? More, more or less. She's like, I, I don't know. They said a lot. Okay, so <laughs> um, one of the questions um, that I wanted to ask was about 
um, putting this into practice, um, and we've, we've brought this up in a number of ways, right? So we, we talked a little bit about, and heard concerns from the audience a little bit about um, the high level of investment, about navigating through and negotiating through things um, that deal with the sort of organizational structures and practices and expectations like budget and time frames and goals, right? On the one hand, on the other hand, the kind of um, sort of a deep level of personal commitment potentially called for in this sort of thing, right? So um, what would you all as a panel, what would you say would be sort of key things or key issues that folks would want to keep in mind in terms of approaching this as, say, a career direction choice um, in, and getting there? It's a tough question. I'm going to give them what we'll have a little, a little uh, break here while they're thinking about that um, particular question. But I'm thinking from the point of view, especially of young people, right, who, who might be looking to think about beginning to engage in this kind of practice. You know, oof, what am I facing? What should I be most prepared to think about and tackle? It's all about you know, resources. I think a lot, of people, a lot of young people have the right ideas you know, about collaboration and solving problems, but how do you find the resources to do it? And I guess that's where uh, you know agencies and, and banks and and and, and uh, nonprofits they all come in and you know but they 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 also go up and down with the economy so you know you want to be you know you know sometimes in the private sector you invest a lot of money in, in these things and other times they don't so and if your career kind of you know, goes with that you know maybe you get lucky you know and then you take off but if you're in the in the in the lull, you know, you had to be thinking twice about, you know, doing things. So I, I don't know. It's it's not an easy answer, you know, in my mind. You know, you really have to. Uh, at the end of the day, we all have to make money. <laughs> so um, I think your career would be a lot more satisfying, you know, if if you also make a living, <laughs> not just solving problems for other people. Yeah. That's my opinion, anyway. <laughs> Um, so I'm trying to answer this for myself, I guess. Um, but I think one thing, too, is as you're kind of just starting to move forward, is thinking about, um, I think it was Bob or someone mentioned in terms of working through regional networks and partners and looking at who's already invested in the area, because I think we all know, you know, we have this ideal way of how we would want to conduct work, and then there's a lot of times the reality of what funding um, timelines look like, of what work timelines look like, um, family, you know, obligations, um, and so what we can realistically do. And so I think utilizing really a partnership format of doing things so we're not isolated in our own silos. And so looking at, you know, okay, here's ideally what I'd want to make happen. Um, here's the reality of maybe what funding sources are kind of saying you can do and then looking at who works in the area and how you can kind of formulate that together and so making sure that you're always making those cross connections um, to kind of facilitate roles together um, to try to make something happen I think. My own sense on it is I've never had a formal job except for one that I created and the critical thing about finding resources from my perspective was often about passion and one of the things passion is something new to say and so I found a lot of this community engagement type of work gave me very different perspectives and when I went out and talked about that and had different kinds of research findings then often doors opened up for funding that I wouldn't have expected and jobs began to come up that weren't out there and advertised and so I think the other big piece is when you look at a funding horizon and traditional trajectories is to say, look, globally, there's going to be more and more focus on how do we deal with the impacts of climate change. Ultimately, a lot of those things are about people's behavior at the local level. So you're entering a door early on, and if you've got confidence and if you're able to go out there, do some great work with people and then talk about it, you may find actually that there are more opportunities than you think from a quote-unquote sort of external objective search of, of things. 
And so, you know, having, having a degree of, of kind of confidence and some luck around that doesn't hurt. Sorry, Bob. Thank you. Um, my graduating class from high school, a number of us got together about five years afterwards, and uh, friends who majored in history and political science all said they did it, but you know, they'd always have teaching to fall back on. And I said, I was in cultural ecology and anthropology, I would have hunting and gathering to fall back on. Um, <laughs> the idea that monocultures always collapse um, you should really diversify, um, diversify your interests, find ways to, I mean, as we just heard a couple of good examples of, of diversifying your interests across the questions that do, that you do have passion about. And um, I think that working with communities that are holistic in nature and facing uh, a myriad of problems and, and trying to organize all sorts of solutions keeps you out of that uh, academic um, uh, siloing of, of interest and and uh, refinement and activity. So I think that uh, you know, getting outside the box once in a while is always a good thing. Yeah, so so as Bob is saying, one of the key things is not to leave one box and jump in another. And I mean, you talked about when you graduated from, and so that was around 1066, I think. That, yeah. <laughs> so the idea here. This morning? <laughs> 66 is a unit on your clock. No. Yeah. So the idea here is this, right? For 50 years now almost, we've been talking about multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity. And it's actually not been working. And the reason why it's not been working is that you need depth in at least one or two areas in terms of methodologies to really be interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. If we were to take a modern view of how policy sciences and um, research is conducted, one of the best scientific books you can read is something called Pasteur's Quadrant from a science policy. Donald Stokes from Princeton wrote it in 1997. The idea is not that one separates into knowledge in an ivory tower, but neither is it a free-for-all, because some answers are, in fact, better than others, even if they're not absolute. So what does one do? You, do, you make sure you get depth in a particular research area and link to people who do the applications. But in the process of doing that, you learn to do those applications as well. So it gives you a sense of getting the credibility within the institutional structure within which you are, but you haven't lost the breath that Bob is after. The alternative to that are people talking about a little bit of everything adding up to nothing. It sounds good. Sounds impressive. In some cases, but there are some of us, that, and some of you in the room, that could spot that a mile off, right? The idea is to understand the methodologies, ways of working that gives you depth. Ensure that you're linked to a problem, that it's problem oriented, that the question you're answering requires multiple methods so you can draw on other knowledge, and that it is contextual, that it is linked to what people are doing on the ground and how they're responding to risk. Those three sort of dimensions get you at when maintaining your credibility within an academic institution while ensuring that you're not trapped by it. We have a question? Yeah, I think, this is, I think this is directed to the Thriving Earth Exchange, but it could be relevant to, to others. Um, did you use the development of this exchange as a way to establish a more formal connection with social scientists? Uh, the, the, the notion here is that if you, just for an example, if you go to Ostrom's 2009 paper in Science, she talks about specific aspects of social systems that lead to sustainability. Knowledge of the system is one of them, and there are several other variables in which science is directly implicated. Um, so it seems to me that doing this kind of work, you're essentially running an experiment. It's, it's based on what is essentially kind of a very, uh, 
let's say, progressive ideology, which you, you might want to examine whether or not those assumptions are, are correct or not. And I would, in that instance, I would particularly go back to expecting everybody to do something voluntarily, I think is probably not the right way to go. We need more money dedicated to these problems. But that's an aside from my main point, is this could be a very interesting way to reach out to a community that AGU really does need to touch. And it's not ecologists and geographers playing political scientists, but like real political scientists and real bounded rationality experts. And I, I think this would be a way to do it. So I'm just curious what you did when you created the exchange with your relationship with social sciences. Yeah, it's an excellent question and a point well taken. Our advisory board has social scientists on it and not sort of one or two. Um, we've tried to really bring in and we're actively reevaluating our advisory board as we go forward to see if we have the right kinds of social scientists for each stage of the project, right? One of the, I think one of the, one of the mistakes you can often make in the physical science is being really particular about making sure you have a geodynamicist and a hydrologist, and then let's just get a couple social scientists and we'll be good, <laughs> right? So we're trying not to make that mistake. Um, many of our, at least some of our projects um, have actually come out of collaborations with people who identify themselves as social scientists and they've helped us frame them. Um, and in fact, one of the things we're struggling with right now, we're actually getting a little bit of a kick, I mean, it's a great learning opportunity, right? So one of the things we're hearing, which is a little like one of the questions, I think, which is like, wait, are you trying to remake us into social scientists or are you trying to help us collaborate with social scientists? In the same sense, I think the, the sort of the question is, are we, you know, how much, I want to invest, I want to, be, I want to be contextual and aware, but I'm also not of a community. I'm working with a community. And what does that look like and how do we navigate that? And I think social scientists in particular um, have helped us explore that and what that looks like. So it's an excellent question. So one experiment we have called the Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments, most of which are led by people in social science. Um, but one thing I want us to make sure that we're not conflating is that we're creating another ball called social science that also writes its papers that nobody pays attention to. And so we need to be very clear that in fact we are answering questions, that they're problem oriented. When you do that, you bring the necessary information to bear, including local knowledge, and not simply the ones that particular social scientists can study over others. Economists are social scientists too, okay. right? A lot, you could be neoclassical and econometric based or institutional. And so the issue to get at here is what's the question being answered and what is being, how is it being answered? What are the various disciplines that are needed and how will they be integrated? How does one manage that process? Adding an understanding of a social and ecological system together still doesn't mean you've gotten to decision making. It still doesn't mean that. And so the question is, if we're serious about addressing issues but not being advocates at the same time, then one has to ask, how do we enter into decision-making frameworks? That is the fundamental question, what tools need to be brought to bear, as opposed to here's a ball called social science and here's another one called physical, and you add them together and you have an integrated view, but it's limited in predictability. Do we have a question? Good evening, uh, my name is Alexandra and currently I'm working on the Mining Social Responsibility Project in the state of Nevada and I have a practical question. Uh, right now we have very big issues, concerns related to the community sampling or citizen sampling and I will very appreciate if you can share experience if you have it, how we can organize it. Again, we have a very diverse communities and we have a mining companies and people want community samplings. They want related to the water, water quality, of course. Right. So, mm. Thank you. Practical uh, solutions over there. Just because I'm, what? Do you want to take a shot? 
I'm, I'm not quite sure. I mean, basically the question is you have two very, very divergent communities, the mining companies and the local population who have very di distinctly different interests mm -hmm. and concerns and, and basically are in a set of conflict. Yes, absolutely, yes. Mining companies, they don't want allow citizens to make uh, water sample, samples, to take water samples. But people, of course, from Nevada, they want it. And they ask, uh, uh, they ask us to help them. And what is your tip? How we, like, um, what kind of points I can bring to the mining company to help establish this community sampling? Yeah, I mean, a lot of our work has been done in things that are not as active at that conflict stage or not as direct. Um, you know, generally what's happened in that sort of situation is um, organizations that work directly with the communities that are affected um, becoming advocates, you know, and so it becoming a kind of negotiated meeting point. Um, but it's very hard to do in a pure neutral research situation. I, the closest thing that we'd have had would be communities that are being displaced by heavy flooding and the government being very interested in developing the area, so very strong conflicts of interest. Um, and there it's generally been, um, you know, there's been a role for an organization that can talk to both to see if they can come up with um, avenues that are acceptable to both to explore. Um, you know, but it's not a simple, you know, sometimes you just have conflict. Yeah, and, and it, I mean, it, it may speak to maybe Roger's point that, that when, once you've identified sort of the expertise you need to solve a problem, you may recognize that some of that expertise isn't you, and then you look for the partners who have that expertise. One of the things to keep in mind in that context is, is in not being an advocate, you at least have to make the risks from a scientific standpoint transparent to all groups involved. That's the entry point for a discussion. I mean, from my standpoint as a public servant, my, my responsibility is to the public. Everyone who is involved should have the same information that we're providing so that they can ask the same questions. And I laid out a methodology. And with that, um, we are drawing to a close. Uh, we have presented this panel to you over a long stretch. Thank you for hanging in there, everyone, uh, with limited commercial interruption. So we have one final commercial announcement before we, we release you. <laughs> and now a word from our sponsor. Um, so, so the idea of this is to present a, a set of experiences throughout the annual meeting, throughout the fall meeting, that, that sort of lead through this idea of community science. So today was kind of the notion that community science is a rigorous endeavor that can be engaged in professionally and it can be part of the scientific repertoire. Um, on Tuesday afternoon, we have a visitor from San Francisco who's led communities in San Francisco, neighborhoods in San Francisco, through resilience planning activities and he's going to lead a group of, uh, sorry? Thursday. Thursday. Oh, on Thursday. Yeah, right. I'm inviting you to something that already happened. Sorry. Um, no, it's on Thursday. Um, and he's going he's gonna to lead us through that activity and then do a meta-analysis of how that activity could be used to engage um, a local community maybe that you're already part of in a conversation around resilience as a way of beginning this, this getting to know you dialogue. And then on Thursday evening, we're having a networking session where some of the projects I talked about are going to present in very quick little snippets the kind of work they've been doing and the kind of lessons they've learned. But then we're going to have a lot of time for informal interaction with adult beverages. So. All, the, all the best parts. So with that, I just want to thank everybody for coming. And I'm sure that the panelists will be delighted to talk with you informally um, through the rest of the conference. Thank you, everybody. Great.